Good evening, folks. How are we? Good, okay. Seeing some approving nods. That is a good sign. So tonight we're going to begin our uh, sermon series, talk to you about my butt, in Exodus. We're going to look at how God is working in the life of the family of Israel. And we're going to start uh, with a very familiar figure, I hope, to most of us, the person of Moses. Before we do that, how many of us make New Year's resolutions? Show of hands. One, two, three, four. Okay. A small, a small percentage. <laughs> how many of us are keeping those resolutions currently? <laughs> One. <laughs> I was banking on there being none. Well done. <laughs> well done to you too. <laughs> well, as you may have guessed, we, when I'm talking about resolutions, we make all kinds of resolutions, don't we? One year we say that we're going to exercise more, we're going to run that marathon, we're going to get lean, get that summer bod, as you might say. <laughs> I wouldn't say that, but you're welcome to. <laughs> <laughs> that was you, Timothy. <laughs> <laughs> or otherwise, we might want to stop doing those harmful habits and behaviours, the things that we know we shouldn't, drinking too much. And taking drugs and harming ourselves in more ways than one. We want to better ourselves in some way. We want to live our best lives, as it were, in 2022. In some ways, you could say that making a New Year's resolution is sort of like making a promise to yourself. This year, Things are going to be different. This year, I'm, I'm older, I'm wiser, and I'm not better looking, so it must be better this year. This year, things will change. I know they can. I know I have it in me. I have that resolution. I have that dynamite edge factor that makes me capable of change. But let me ask you another question. How many of our resolutions include our consideration towards our walk with God? That's a rhetorical question. I'm not, I'm not outing people just yet. If we're really honest, probably most of our resolutions lose sight of the fact that God is our Father, that He is in control, that He is working in every aspect of His creation, and that includes your life, as seemingly little as it may seem. Are we considering how God might be maturing and shaping us through the new year, even as we aim to get leaner, even as we aim to eat healthy, even as we aim to finally put to death those pet sins? Do we consider what role God has to play? Yeah. Or is it a very British step up or lip, pull yourself up by the bootstraps kind of mentality that I know I'm guilty of, and I'm fairly certain most of us will be guilty of that at some point or another. And besides this, how many of us actually keep to these plans? Now, there's two hands up uh, today, which was very impressive to me. But most of the time, as well as attention as they are, we can't even keep to our own promises. We can't even keep to our own standards. Never mind look to God to see what He has to say in the matter. Can we really expect to, to honour the promises that we make to ourselves when we leave God out of the picture? But thankfully, God is not like us. As we begin our series in Exodus, we're going to see how in lots of ways, God is completely set apart from us. I hope that that's not a revelation for you at this point. And I hope that's something that most of us maybe know, that God is a bit different from us. Uh, but this series, we're going to see in what ways. We're going to see exactly the depths of how God is set apart from us. How he is different and how he works in a completely different way than what we might do. We're going to see tonight though that God is a God of promises. More than that, he's a God who actually keeps his promises. So not particularly like us. Before we get into our passage, let me pray for us and 
Father God, I pray now that you will enlighten your words in our, in our eyes, in our hearts, Lord, that as we read through, uh, as, as you speak through your word, Father, you will make it living and active to us, not just words on the page, not just some historical um, facts and dates, but in the living words that we can experience you in your word. Father, I pray tonight that we can experience you in your word. Amen. So, if you've got a Bible or a Bible app handy, let's turn to Exodus. Uh, we're going to be covering both chapters 1 and 2, but uh, we're going to start with just chapter 1, just to break it up a tiny bit. So, before we do that though, I'm going to give you a little bit of backdrop, which is a little bit important. So, so far uh, in the Bible, we've had the creation of the world, we've had the first man and the first woman, we've had sin, not a great point, uh, and all throughout Genesis, from the point of the fall, we see God's people, God's family, trying to do their best, trying to honour God, and not really being successful in it. On our theme tonight of promises, if you look through Genesis, if you've read through Genesis before, promises, or covenants, if you want to use that word, are abounding in Genesis. All the way through Genesis, God makes promises. He makes covenants with his people, or with particular um, members of his people, to act, upon, act on behalf of everyone. For example, in Genesis 12, he makes a promise to Abraham that his, name, his offspring will be a great nation. They will multiply. They will know God's blessings. He makes the same promise or reestablishes the same promise to Abraham's son Isaac. And then again to Isaac's son Jacob. All the way through from the start, from Adam and Eve, God is making promises. Even in the beginning, God makes a promise to Adam and Eve that they should have dominion over the earth, that they should multiply and flourish. This theme of multiplication, of flourishing, of knowing God's blessings by being in union with God crops up all the way through Genesis. God makes a promise to Abraham and it's a promise of a people, multiplied nations, and a promise of a land. There is a particular place where God's people ought to be, which he has positioned for them. God promises to bless all nations through Abraham's family. Another word that's kind of thrown about uh, in some of the studies and commentaries on this uh, is that this promise is called the Emmanuel Covenant. What that means? Covenant properly means promise. We've covered that already. Emmanuel means God with us. In other words, it is God's promise to his people that he will be with them, that he will be their God and they will be his people, to quote another part of Genesis. But fast forward to the end of Genesis and we have Joseph, who has, by this point, now been effectively made Prime Minister of Egypt. And through his God-fearing leadership, has protected Egypt from many, many years of famine. Again, we see God's people, under Joseph's care, under Joseph's mediation, have been blessed and protected and have flourished. But since then, this is us fast-forwarding to Exodus, since then, God's people have been enslaved in Egypt for about 400 years. Which, again, fulfills another prophecy that God made, another promise he made in Genesis 15, 13. But, right after this verse, God also promises redemption for the offspring of Abraham, Genesis 14. If you want to turn with me, just briefly, just to see that, Genesis 15, verses 13 and 14. says this verse 13 and the Lord said to Abraham that's Abraham before he was called Abraham know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners or exiles 
in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there and they will be afflicted for 400 years. Verse 14, but I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. Fast forward to Exodus, the people are enslaved in Egypt. Suddenly what God said back in Genesis is coming true. Throughout Genesis we see the maintaining and renewal of promises, of God's initial promise to Abraham. But now we begin with the story of Jacob's family, who by this point have grown exponentially. And they're now called the nation of Israel, or the family of Israel, you could say. Let's read now, as we begin uh, this story of the family of Israel, of Abraham's many sons and daughters, of which we are all members. Exodus chapter 1. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died, and all his brothers and all that generation. But the people of Israel, Jacob's family, were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. Now, there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly uh, with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from this land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. Then the king of Egypt says to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Hua, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew woman and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and let the male children live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God had dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every son that is born to the Hebrews, you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. Just a casual bit of infanticide to start with. Lovely stuff. So, what do we see happening here in this chapter? Joseph and family have come to Egypt. Joseph has died, and all his family. However, uh, their children, their offspring, have grown. They are now a nation. And they're now a nation being oppressed by an evil king, Pharaoh. A king who is threatened by their number, threatened by their obedience to God, uh, that the killing of every newborn son seems like, a, seems like the most obvious approach. A little bit risky. We see in verse 7, if you look with me, people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and 
grew extremely strong, so the land was filled with them. Like I said before, Genesis is filled with the making and re-establishing of promises. Exodus, we see the fulfilling, or at least partial fulfilling, of a lot of these promises. Way back in Genesis 1.28, the Lord promised to Adam and Eve that their offspring would multiply across the earth. This has happened. God is faithful to that promise. God's people prosper because of the promise. In many places in the passage, the writer says that the people, particularly the midwives, were God-fearing. And right after says, and they were blessed, or and they were prosperous in some translations. The fear of God, or a right relationship with God, is directly linked to knowing God's blessings and prospering as a result. Look at 8 to 14. We see the fulfillment of another promise made in Genesis 15. That promise being, your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. This is happening at the beginning of our passage. God wasn't lying. He wasn't kidding. He is true to what he promises, to what he prophesies. Again, though, the second part of that promise of redemption, of judgment on Egypt, well, we hope that's going to happen. It's not happened yet in the story. But, based on God's track record of making and keeping promises so far, I think it's a fair bit to say that redemption is just down the road for the Israelites. Verses 15 to 22, we see God's sovereignty and providence. He brings blessings out of persecution for the women of Israel. The women are asked to kill any newborn boys that they help deliver from the Hebrew wives. But they, very bravely, refuse this. And so God blesses the children through the God-fearing ways of the midwives. The fact that they knew God, the fact that they feared God more than Pharaoh, brought blessing upon the people of Israel. What we're beginning to see in little pockets in this passage is one of the central themes of Exodus. From the very beginning, the God, that God remembers his promises and keeps his promises made to Abraham. God has purposed to keep his promises. It's the way that he works. He makes the promise, he keeps the promise. He is always going to do that. And he's not going to let anyone, not Pharaoh, not Satan, get in the way of that. But what does that mean for us? It means if we believe that God is the same God that he is in Exodus, that the God of the Old Testament is the same now as he was yesterday, He's the God that we call Father today. And this has huge implications for us. If God is the same, if he is our heavenly Father, then this means that those same promises made to Abraham, made to Jacob, made to Isaac, made to the people of Israel, still hold today. That God is still with us, that God will keep his promises, that God remembers his people. In the Old Testament, it was a promise of a covenant relationship with Israel. Nowadays, it's the church. It's us. In the Old Testament, the promise of God's presence with them was manifested in a tent. We'll see more of that at the end of our series. Today, we have the guarantee of the Holy Spirit. Different images, a tent, indwelling spirit, but the same promise. God is with us. And the same fulfillment of that promise. God has also promised to fill the earth with the glories of Christ. Christ has promised to build his church. God is still on the throne as he was back then. He is the one we should fear. No one else. This is what you've been called to, cousins. 
to stand in awe and wonder at the glory of Christ, to trust in the promises of God and God alone. God remembers his people. He knows us better than we know ourselves, and he keeps his promises. Let's continue in chapter 2. Chapter 2. Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and dulled it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed among the reeds placed it among the reeds by the river bank. And his sisters stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, while her young woman walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman, and she took it. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse from the Hebrew room to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. Just as a little aside here, the person nursing the child is Moses' actual mother. She's being paid to be a mother. She's being paid to nurse her own child. God's provision is, is really great sometimes. <laughs> it's always great. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. She named him Moses because, she said, I drew him out of the water. One day, when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew one of his people. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. Just to alleviate any, um, any confusion there, the phrase struck down is more accurately translated murdered. Just so we're He murdered this person and hid the body. When he went out the next day, behold, Two Hebrews were struggling together, and he said to the man in the wrong, Why do you strike your companion? He answered, Who is you, prince and judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid, and thought, Surely the thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. The shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and saved them and watered their flock. When they came home to their father, Raoul, he said, How is it that you have come home so soon today? And they said, An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and even drew water for us and watered the flock. He said to his daughters, Then where is he? Why have you left this man? Call him that he may eat bread. And Moses was content to dwell with the man, and he gave Moses his daughter, Zipporah. She gave birth to a son, and he called his name Gershon. For he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. There's that phrase again, that fulfillment of prophecy. Verse 23, During those many days, the king of Egypt died. And the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. And God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and Jacob. God saw the people of Israel and God knew. So, Second chapter, enter Moses, the man who, as we'll see later on in our story, will become God's chosen 
mediator for Israel, the person that is the go-between between God and his people. Just on that note there, one man being appointed by God to act as a mediator, to act as a go-between, sort of, between God and his people. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Maybe it should do. It sounds suspiciously like Jesus, don't you think? If you look at Hebrews 11, you don't have to do it right now, you can see an account of this. You can see uh, all the way through Hebrews 11, an uh, account of great men and women of faith that have shown their faithfulness to God in their obedience to his word, to his purposes, and how all the way through the Old Testament, starting with Abraham and continuing all the way through, including Moses, these people were preparing the way for one who would be greater. Moses, in the position that he is going to fill as mediator, is partially fulfilling what will be fully fulfilled, if that's a word, in Christ, the great mediator. In fact, right after Hebrews 11, in the beginning of chapter 12, it begins in verse 3 by saying, consider him, in other words, Jesus. What I mean by that, by pointing that out, is that the story of Moses and Israel and of all the patriarchs and great men and women of faith in Scripture should, according to the writer of Hebrews, lead us to consider Christ. In fact, the whole Old Testament should nudge us in the direction of Jesus. The New Testament as well is centered around Jesus. His life, death, and resurrection is in every page. And then even in the epistles, they refer back to Jesus over and over again. Are we really surprised, or should we be surprised, that the Bible says us around Christ? I don't think so, or at least I hope we don't think that. It is about him, after all. And this idea of Moses becoming a mediator is just another way in which God's word, in which God, in his wisdom, in his organising and orchestrating of redemptive history, is pointing the way to Christ in the person of Moses. But let's look closely now in verses 1 to 10. How many similarities to Christ can be spot. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine child, or beautiful child, she hid him three months. That's the same as Jesus' birth story. He was hid because of his beauty. Moving on, he was, uh, he was having to hide away from fear of a jealous and mad tyrant king. Pharaoh in this instance. But fast forward to the gospel and you see Jesus being hidden and protected from the tyrannical wrath of King Herod. There's another one. All the way through these passages, you can find them uh, as, you, as you slip through uh, the ver- verses 1 to 10, we connections. You can see that God is faithful and he provides it unfolds from the circumstances of Moses' birth right up to his protection and care with his own mother. God has ultimate control here. He is making sure that Moses is protected. More than that, he is making sure that the continuation of his redemptive plan happens. He is ensuring uh, that his plans will unfold the blessings of Israel, because all things are worked together by God for good. Romans 8.28 speaks of that. But again, in the next section, in verses 11 to 22, we see a foreshadowing of Christ in even the life of Moses. Moses places himself in a position of authority when he sees his um, brothers and fighting over each other, he acts in authority and judgment over sin, like Jesus does. In verse 15, Moses has to flee to the wilderness 
before he begins his ministry properly, before he begins his appointment as a mediator. Jesus does the same thing. Moses, even in his time in Midian, becomes a good shepherd. Jesus is the great good shepherd. All the way through, we can see the writer of Exodus giving them little hints, little glimpses into Christ through the life of Moses. But in, oh, skip, skip, skip there. in Exodus 1, we see the promise to Abraham being fulfilled in a people. Israel has become a nation. But in chapter 2, Moses finds a partial fulfillment of the second part of the promise, of a promised land. Moses flees to Midian, which was part of the original promised land, which included Canaan. But the rest of the people are still miles away in slavery in Egypt, further away from experiencing any kind of rest. We have a people without a land, and we have a Moses without a people. How can we put the two together? Well, the answer to that lies in some of the following chapters that we're going to look at. But let's just quickly have a look at this last section of chapter 2, from verses 23 to 25. Let me read it once more. During those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. And, and focus on this bit, God heard their groan. God remembered his covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. God remembered his promises. He saw their groaning. He knew what was going on in their hearts. It is God's promise to Abraham that will drive the story forward. This is the cliffhanger that we're left on. People of Israel are in slavery and they are crying out to God. Moses is somewhere out in the wilderness of Midian, being shepherd. And we're left with this cliffhanger. God remembers the promises. He knows. I think what the writer is trying to say to us is that it is God who is going to drive the story forward. Not Moses, necessarily, by himself, and not the people of Israel. God is the one who is going to act, who is going to fulfill his promises. He's going to take the next step in his plan to fulfill his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That even harks back to the cultural mandate of Adam and Eve, like we said before. The story of God liberating his people, which we will see in the coming chapters, is really a microcosm for the whole Bible. It sets the pattern for the liberation of all nations from bondage to Satan. In this instance, the Israelites are in bondage to Pharaoh and he needs a person to lead them out. In the same way, before we knew Christ, we were in bondage to Satan, to sin. And we need a mediator, we need a saviour to step in to offer liberation, to offer Redemption. Essentially, the entirety of Scripture is a story of God liberating us from sin and leading us back home. And this is the role that Moses is going to perform as well. One important note to make here is that suffering is obviously a big part in this chapter, in these two chapters. Israel are being ruthlessly dealt with the wording that we used. But something I don't want us to confuse is that suffering, the presence of suffering, does not negate the power and the authority of God's purposes and plans. He is in control and he can work out his good purposes. He will work out his good purposes even in suffering. It's one of the main ways that God can work is using suffering help us to cling to him more in faith, to help clarify our identity as his children, to increase our longing for him. So just because suffering is in the picture doesn't mean that God isn't. Anyway, 
Let me finish with this. The covenant promise concept, the whole idea of a covenant promise, really defines the relationship between God and his people. It begins in Genesis, it continues to the Old Testament, and it covers the entirety of Scripture. We need to remember that we are part of that. We need to remember that the covenant promise that God made to Adam and Eve, re-established with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and as we'll see with Moses, continues to this day. The language that's used, every time a covenant or a promise is made, every time God initiates uh, such promises, the language that's used is of a continual promise. That God is going to be continually establishing his purposes and his plans in our lives. He's going to be continually renewing us through his presence. So, the very promises that God made to Abraham and to all the other patriarchs are the very ones that he has made to his people today. Just like Israel at the beginning of Exodus, we are people of promise. Hopefully this should give us confidence in God's overarching purposes for our lives and enable us to be courageously obedient to God. It's one of the best um, traits of Moses is that in the face of adversity, in the face of persecution and suffering and oppression, he is courageously obedient to God. I'm going to finish by reading some verses from Galatians uh, and then uh, I'm going to pray and invite the band up. So if we turn to Galatians 3. Verses 7 to 9. It says this, Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. It is by faith, as Galatians says, as Hebrews 11 says, as so many other bits in the Bible say, it is by faith that we know the blessings and promises, the fulfilled promises of God in Christ. God is preparing the way in this story for one who will bring Israel out of exile and out of slavery and at the same time is foreshadowing, preparing the way for one who will bring all nations out of exile and slavery by his death and resurrection. Just like the Israelites, we are sojourners in a foreign land. The minute you give your life to Christ, where you were born is no longer your home. It is no longer the place that you belong. From this point until uh, Jesus returns, we are pilgrims. We haven't got to home yet. We have, however, been freed from sin, from the slavery of sin. And we long for that day when God will lead us home. Let us be courageously obedient and trusting in God's plans for our life. That our Father who has delivered us from sin will also fulfill his promise to take us home. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for who you are, Lord. For your faithfulness for your provision that knows no bounds. Lord, help us as we think about uh, your words, as we think about your character, to trust in your plans, to know that you're working all things for good, to know that although we are not the finished product yet, you have promised to bring us to completion in Christ Jesus. You have promised us freedom from sin, and you promised us a land, that being with you in heaven. Father, help us to keep our eyes fixed on that promise, that although we are stuck uh, here on earth, and with all of our failings, with all of our uh, diminishing um, lives, the way our health 
getting worse, the world getting worse, the rendered all these things that we see around us that are just not good. It can get us down. And Lord, help us to instead look up and see our Heavenly Father, who is faithful and who will take us home. Amen. Let's stand.